This week on Constructed Criticism. We do the set review for Ether Revolt. It's pretty exciting, something we've been, uh, you know, wanting to do for a couple weeks. One thing that is that we don't have uh, some of the stuff that we typically have when we podcast because I switched jobs. I had to give back my work laptop, which is what we use for most of the podcasts. So this one's going to be a little bit more unedited, uh, a little bit more raw. I just want to remind everybody that set reviews are opinion based for us. You know, we are just as prone to hyperbole as much as we try not to be as a lot of other magic players. And sometimes, you know, we're not going to agree on cards with all of our listeners. We understand that we can be wrong about these cards and we're okay with that. You know, a lot of zeros were given during the set review. And we just want to remind everybody that, you know, if you think the card is good, go test it, make an awesome deck. And if the deck you make is great, awesome. Go crush people with it. We, we want to be wrong because we want magic cards to be good too. So thank you everybody for listening and enjoy the episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Constructed Criticism. I'm your host, Spencer, and I'm joined by my co-host, the man who doesn't want me on his couch, Michael Hinderocker. That's right. You stay on your own couch, Spencer. <laughs> the man who thinks it's funny, Casey Bloodworth. Hey, what's up? And what's also, it? how's it going? What's new? You know, what's cracking? Uh, that's that's what's not part of our contract. You can't say any of that. Wait, you have to specifically say those things? Yeah, those are the only two things we're allowed to say. I so. feel like I don't approve of this contract. Well, well that's you why you come to the meetings. You should come. <laughs> so you end up fantasy football commissioner. So, real talk. If you could see five minutes into the future, like, I would just go to Vegas. It, like, I understand that I could make... First of all, I could make way more money on the stock market. But, like, I just would... I could be in Vegas instead. Yeah, and like I don't know if you've ever tried to read the financial section of a newspaper, but like it's not super exciting. And then you have to, or like the Yahoo ticker, even then you have to like look and see. And yeah, but you could do all this in your like, underwear. It'd be so much better. But then I you could do all have, of like, it in my underwear in Vegas if I had enough money. Gil, so can you really like trade stocks in five minutes? Like I know that like it's much faster than it used to be. You don't have to like call down to somebody, but. I, I know you can I feel like do. You'd have to actually do it like from the the floor of the New York Stock Exchange to be able to get like that any was real my initial thought. Like when I was thinking window. about this five minute superpower, I was like, I feel like I would have to be on the floor, I, I and then I was like, I'd rather just go to Vegas. Trading. I know you can do forex trading. That's that will work in that kind of increment. All right. Well, but, you know, really, whatever. You know what's similar to a stock market? That's buying magic cards. You can go to Oasis Games. Uh, you can check them out on mdgoasis.com, oasisccc.com, and oasisgamesslc.com. Uh, you can buy all your magic cards there. You can get 50% off your first order by using the code CCMPG at checkout, and you can get 5% or 4% off of every order by using the code. Would that be good? They are the sponsor of this podcast. I highly encourage you to check them out. They are amazing. We're doing the set review this week, so like very different podcasts. going to be more laid back. It's going to be fun. We're going to talk about some magical cards. And, uh, yeah, check out Oasis. And is then the, is, is there a spending threshold at which they'll give you the superpower to look five minutes into the future? Because I haven't achieved that one yet. Uh, if if they did, I would... I, I mean, I just feel like that would be, like, an unreal great superpower. Like, it's one that I don't know that anybody would catch you at. Like, Yeah, I mean, you'd get kicked out of a lot of casinos, but, like... You only have to thirty. Like to lose a you couple only have of to times. thirty-five times twice to have four million dollars, right? Yeah. So, like, it adds up fast. Yeah. I, I. Thank you. Thank you for my, for my monies. Um. Anyway, <laughs> we're we're doing the set review this week, so that means we're going to we ask our patrons uh, for their top twenty cards in Ether Revolt. So we're going to use that, put it with our top 20 cards, and we give them an AP ranking, similar to like the AP pool in sports. So that means that if you rank the card 1, it gets 20 points, 2, it gets 19 points, 3, 18 points, and so on. Um, to be have this benefit and be part of the show, you just have to become a patron of $1 or more per month, and then every time we do a set review, you too can, can do the show with us. Um, there's also other benefits that are pretty awesome, and it's really helpful for the show. So go to patreon.com slash ccmtg, and you too can uh, can be a part of this. So, But we're going to get right into this. Sorry, one more thing. So if you can see five minutes into the future and you're listening to a podcast, does it just get really difficult because you're hearing like stacked audio? I think the point of the superpower is you can like decide when you're going to see five minutes into the future. Okay. It does it like have to be time. exactly five minutes? Like, that's like less valuable for things like coin flips. 
<laughs> you have to anticipate the coin flip in advance. Yeah. I don't know. The superpower is sounding difficult. Like, yeah. I mean, if you were permanently stuck, you could see you five minutes in the future, but you had to act in the present. That would be like a nightmare. But, um, You'd probably just get hit by a car the first time you cross the street and that would be the end of can it. We, can we move on from this superpower now? Yeah. What, you don't want five-minute superpower of the podcast? No. Okay. No, I don't. I want the podcast the podcast. Um. Yeah, Let's. so let's get right into this. So that's how the points break down for... Uh, the set review, and we're going to start with, uh, obviously, number 20. So number 20 on this list uh, we have is Hungry Flames. Hungry Flames is an instant for a red and two, and it deals three damage to target creature and two damage to that target creature's controller. Yeah, sort of a, a blaze effect, searing blaze or searing blood effect. Um, those effect cards oh, are usually... actually, I, I said that wrong. to me. Yeah, it's two damage to target player. So it does both. So even if the creature dies, it doesn't stop it. Yeah, that's how Searing Blaze works, too. Um, Not how Searing Blood works, though. Yeah, yeah, sure. If they kill their creature in response to Searing right. Blood, it doesn't trigger. Yeah. Um, so this one does cost three mana instead of two, which is, you know, arguably a little bit worse or significantly worse, but it only costs... It's arguably <laughs> worse. <laughs> Arguably one more mana is at least one more mana. It's... Yeah, exactly. It's just, you know, factual. Uh, but unlike Searing Blood, it only costs one red. So it could see play in less heavily focused decks. It's a pretty reasonable effect for a card. I expect we'll see certainly some amount of standard play. Yeah, so Hungry Flames came in with 17 points. Uh, you know, means most people probably had it somewhere on their list. And I think, I think the card is reasonable. I think that it's... Something that you definitely could see standard play with. Um, you know, for those who don't know how we do the grading on the show, it's from zero to five. Zero being unplayable, five being a multi format all star. And if I were to give this card a grade, it would be probably like a two. I think it's below average. Um, I think that three mana is a lot to ask for a, a spell that deals three damage to a creature. And the thing that's important to know about this card it, is you do. Wait, is it two to a player and three to a creature? Or... Yes. Okay. The thing that's important to know is that you actually do need a creature in play to cast this spell. So it's not like against a control deck, this is still a burn spell that can target them unless you want to target one of your own creatures. Although that is because it doesn't say to that player's controller. That's true. So it that, still becomes an to that creature's controller rather. That, I mean, that like that's not nothing. When you're looking for sort of the last points of damage and the fact that it won't get fizzled by them, say, like, Grasp of Darkness and your guy in response, right? That it, it's just once you cast it, it needs to be countered or it's going to I mean, happen. To its benefit, even, if they were to Grasp of Darkness your guy, you could do this in response to get this out of your hand. Sure, that's true as well. It's... This is a, kind of a funny one. It's like... If it were either one in a red or red red, I would say I know this card is very good. Because yeah, one we, in a red, we, it would be great. Well, it would but, be but, extremely but red good. red would be very good as well. We because yeah. we've just seen this effect, and at two mana, it's very strong, even if the numbers are slightly tweaked. I believe this card falls into the it, it, same category of like brimstone volley as like how good a card can be. It has a ceiling that's like reasonably high for a card, but its floor could be like really low if like it just never fits into a deck. And I, I think that that's why I would give it a 2. Yeah, I would agree. 2 to 2.5. It's probably extremely good in the aggressive deck mirror and Pretty mostly poor the rest everywhere. of the time. Yeah. But, I mean, the flip side is if, if you're playing a lot of that, if that becomes a big thing, right? I mean, if we're playing a bunch of, like, aggro mirrors, this card is clearly great in that spot. Oh, yeah. So, so that's, much. I mean, that's not nothing. Yeah, it, it's... Not quite a two for one, right? Because it only does one thing. But if if a burn spell is like if you're willing to it's, cast a right. lava spike, right? Yep. This is basically a two for one if you kill a creature with it. So, well, or even if it just helps you like trade up, you know, a smaller creature or a larger one, whatever. I mean, those those matchups so frequently come down to sort of attacking without a dominating board presence. That cards like this are just really really strong in those kind of matchups. Yeah, exactly. Just kind of getting the most out of your cards, and this card can add up to a lot of value. Next up, we have Vengeful Rebel. This card is a black and two for a 3-2 creature, Aetherborn Warrior. It has Revolt, so whenever uh, it enters the battlefield with Revolt, 
If a permanent you control, well, sorry, I'm just going to read this correctly. <laughs> it says revolt. When Vengeful Rebel enters the battlefield, if a permanent you control left the battlefield this turn, target creature if an opponent controls gets minus three, minus three until end of turn. Uh, so I was very interested by what you said when you walked into the room and saw this on the list, Michael, because you said that it was skin render. Yeah, I mean, it's which costs not... five mana. Costs four, four mana. Okay. Okay. But, sure. Four, four mana. But that's what it feels like. I mean. I I haven't played a ton with this guy mostly because the the software I was using didn't have it in there for some reason. So I've been a little bit limited on playing games with this guy, but this guy seems really powerful to me. Like if you're playing these sort of an, another card where it's sort of in like an aggressive mirror, you can really change the direction a game is going with like if you if you attack your guys into their guys, they block, one of your guys dies, some of their guys die, then you're able to follow it up with a creature that kind of furthers that swing. Yeah. When I saw it's it, I was just, like, I thought it was an easier to trigger Wasteland Strangler. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly the card that it compares most directly to because they're both three. They're kind of, they play in a very similar space of, you know, a really powerful card with some deck building cost. Uh, but the deck building cost yeah. is not really nearly as high on this one. I agree. I, I think that this is actually a much easier deck building cost. I, I get that it probably, much like Wasteland Strangler, you can't just play it in literally every deck. But. I think most decks can find some ways to trigger revolt and wastelands. Whereas wasteland strangler really re- requires specific cards. Yeah, exactly. you have like, to be ingesting like, or exiling their cards in some way. This card is just going to be good in like creature matchups in general. I think it's very hard in those kind of matchups for your yeah. opponent to avoid revolt being a thing. I also wonder, and I don't know. I think that there might be some niche situations where it, it makes wasteland strangler better, but like. A lot of the decks that, like, for example, no, I can't think of an example where, like, off the top of my head, where Wasteland Stranger currently is in Modern, where this card might not just be better. Well, I think Eldrazi in Texas is the main place that Wasteland Stranger would seem to be. Right, so that's what I was just going to say. So, like, other than, like, having Eldrazi mana, but here's the thing is, like, uh, this ability is, like, pretty good. I would be willing to give this card a three. I think it's actually just above the curve of like what you can reasonably expect. And it could see modern play, which makes me want to give it like a 3.5. But I, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, it's a card that has a really high power level. Like when it's good, it's going to feel basically oppressive, right? And when at its worst, it's like a three power, th- three oh, mana yeah, guy. It's not horrible. Like if you just have to cast it as a three, two, I mean, it's not great, but it's, you know, it doesn't die to Liliana. There's nothing, like, inherently super embarrassing about it. Yeah, and the thing is, it's like, there's certainly decks that you could construct where, like, this does this effect, like, basically whenever you want it. And then there's decks that you can do it where it does, like, 50% of the time. So it kind of just depends. I, I, I'm i going to give this card a three. I think that it's actually just pretty good. I think this guy's kind of sneaky good. Like, he'll be better in some meta games than others, I think, more than even decks. It mostly depends on what kind of matchups you're playing. But if you're playing against other decks with small creatures, this guy's going to be a beating. Uh, yeah, I agree completely. I think that this will be probably a pretty consistent standard player anytime there's a black creature deck around um, and is is very good. It will definitely have a role the whole time as in standard. It just doesn't take that much work. Like, w- when your downside is being a 3-mana three 3-2, three it's just not that bad a downside. What would you guys give it in a grade? Uh, probably a 3.5. It's hard for me to say because I haven't graded as many cards, but this is a card so that 2. I So 2.5 like... is like an average okay, so, so what's, playable what is, magic card. What is your standard example of a 2.5? Oh, sure. That's a that's a really good point. So um, 2.5s are like the kind of cards that like will see standard play, but like aren't just a jam of a jam four of in your deck. Um, a A three is like... You know, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to play this card. It's going to be like one of the key components of my deck. Not necessarily a four of, but like definitely like a like very important to the con- the structure of my deck. And then when you get to the the four range, that's like this is we're this building is decks this is card. A, the card we're building decks around. So, I think it's pretty clearly not quite at that level, but it's this is like a card that depending more it's more meta game dependent than a lot of the cards that I think you would rate in this kind of space. But it's a card that I could absolutely see playing three to four of and being very happy to do so. Yep. 
Yeah, my only real concern about this card is that it could sort of force its own obsolescence in kind of the same way that Reflector Mage did. It didn't really ever affect the amount of play that it had, but there were so many, because you had to be so conscious of Reflector Mage, it limited the cards you could play. And this is kind of in almost a similar space to that, where it's like, I can't really just get blown out by this all the time, so I, think, I can't play this type of effect. it might be just below that kind of level, and that might actually keep it right at that kind of level, where it's always going to be fairly good, because it's, you know, it's never going to feel, like, super oppressive, but it's going to be just really solid, probably sure. basically every time. Next up, we have Balra's Expertise. This card is three blue-blue for a sorcery. Return up to three target artifacts and or creatures to their owner's hand. You may cast a card with a command mana cost four or less from your hand without paying its mana cost. This card got 19 points, so uh, and it's tied with another card with 19 points. Uh, Casey, what do you think of this card? I don't know. This is one of the harder cards to evaluate in that... If you get full value out of it, like if you put in a Gideon or something horrifying like that, like this is such a blowout where it's, you know, upheaval, you play a really powerful four drop. If your opponent doesn't have enough permanence to be able to get full value out of it, or like the cards you're putting into play aren't that high power, it's, mm, it could be kind of suspect, but I don't know. I think that it, if there's a deck where this card is good, it's likely the best card in the deck. When I saw this card, one of the things that I thought of were like, what are four mana or, or less planeswalkers that don't do a good job of protecting themselves? Yeah, I mean, I, I could see this putting in like a Tezzeret being really powerful. Like, if you already have a couple of artifacts and you're able to bounce the creatures that Tezzeret can't kill and then minus to kill another thing, that seems pretty great. Um if you're putting in a Gideon, like Casey said, where you go from sort of a board where you're a little bit behind and to, to now where like you're ahead, <laughs> now the yeah, game is that's over. That's pretty powerful. Yeah. the The biggest issue with this card, in my mind, is that like so a lot of the expertises struggle with this to some extent. It's like how good is the front, like the the first half of this card, and realistically, like the 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 bottom part is really powerful, right? Like getting to play a four drop if you're getting most of a card out of the first half is great. But you're not always going to have a four drop in hand, like especially when you draw these later in the game. I've played a bit with a bunch of them, and they mostly feel kind of underwhelming in that sense. And it's just a question of like how often you're really going to be able to have three things to bounce. Because if, if you're routinely actually bouncing three things, this card is clearly great. Yeah, yeah uh, very much so. If you... If, like I said, if you're getting full value out of this and putting something into play, it's going to swing the balance of the game in such a dramatic way. Yeah, I would give this card like a 1 to a 1.5 because I think that it's going to be a 2 of in your deck sometimes in a very specific deck. And it's going to be a key role player in that deck, but it's only ever going to be a role player. You know, one of the things that I think that people see when they see these cards is they see, like, the huge upside, right? But they don't really see the cost of having a 5-mana bounce spell in their deck. And if you have a 5-mana bounce spell in your deck against a deck that doesn't care about you bouncing their stuff, like, a very hyper-aggressive deck or a deck that, like, doesn't play things for you to bounce, that's a real cost because it's, like, a 5-mana card. And I think that you're going to limit it on the, like... When you think of, like, a Wrath Effect that costs 5 mana, which people play 2 of now, it, it's already a huge cost that that card costs 5. And this card, while you recoup a lot of that by getting to, like, have synergy in your deck, the front half just isn't good enough to make me think that this will ever be, like, I'm jamming for these. And I've also played with the card, so I think that that's just where I would put it. Yeah, it, it sort of reminds me of Cyclonic Rift more than anything else, where it's, like, the sweetest fun of. Yeah, exactly. It was like, bam, win the game, or kind of didn't do anything, and no, re nowhere really yeah. in between. Right. If you were, if you were seriously like, bounce three of your things, put in Gideon, or like cast a Glimmer of Genius, or whatever. Like, if you're doing like that mode of the card, the game is basically over when you resolve this. Yeah, and also like the fact that it's specifically creatures or artifacts that it can bounce does limit it a little bit. You can't like really get somebody you can't you know get a stasis snare or a planeswalker or yeah, anything. that was actually like, one of my thoughts too is like when, when that was actually one of the things that like when i thought this card exists and maybe that's why i'm so low on it it's like when i saw this card i was like oh man like bouncing like some stasis snares get back like 
get back these guys. Like or like bounce your Liliana on and, six, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, oh yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. So doesn't like, doesn't do with all of that. Yeah. If it did, this card would actually just be like pretty good, even if you weren't consistently casting spells off of it. But so to be fair, I really do like the fact that it does can bounce Panharmonicon. One of the reasons is that is taking a turn off to play Panharmonicon is like a huge, huge. So, so, like investment not that it bounces it but that it oh you want do you want it to bounce your opponent's panharmonic yeah oh well i was gonna say it could hypothetically be interesting with panharmonicon in the sense that it casts you can it. also play your own panharmonicon yeah. or bounce one of your own guys then put it back into play to re-get triggered that's true like uh, with revolt stuff right? I, I was just gonna mention with revolt that does that too so what would you guys give this card as a great i don't know i think that it's probably a one because it's not going to be good often but when it's good it's basically broken oh yeah it's, it's if this card is like doing it to you it is the end of the game like you can't beat the full version of this card right if your opponent is like bounce through your guys put in a gideon make a knight yeah. go you're, you're basically conceding one of the things is, is like how often is this how often is an operator just cast your gideon and then like wrath them and then make a knight itself right like that's that's the real question. Well, well the, so the, the it's because of the like, mana efficiency. Yeah. You're getting all right. that for just five mana instead of nine it's, mana. It's, sure. it's the tempo gain, but like the thing is that when you're also playing a card that half the time does something really busted and half the time does, does basically nothing. nothing, it's really hard to evaluate right. what you're doing. Right. All right. Well, let's go on to the next one. Next up, we have coming in with uh, twenty points. We have Srams, or sorry, yeah. nineteen points again, tied with this card. Rishkar Pima Renegade. This card is two and a green for a 2-2 legendary elf druid. When it enters the battlefield, put a 1-1 one, one counter on each of up to two target creatures. So that, whoa, I didn't even realize this could target itself. That's yes, interesting. It's really three for a 3-3. Three, three. Uh, okay. Uh, and then each creature you control with a counter on it has tapped at a green to your mana pool. Um... Man, this card just got so much better again. Yeah, I haven't gotten to play with this guy a whole lot yet, but this card it, seems like it, actually it seems great, very good. Because, because I think when when you look at cards, like too often, I think you get excited about their upside. But this is a card that, like, just if you have another creature, is great. Three like, mana like for just what you're paying for for your... four power and like ramping yes. you two next turn. Like, I just yeah. I mean, I think this card is just really. It's like its bad case scenarios are fine. Three for a three mana three three that taps for green is its absolute basement, and that is yeah, probably totally. close to a playable magic card. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I've got to play against this card what, a little bit yesterday. What, what can you do for three to six? Um, you can cast a. Uh, I don't I don't know. Big cast two more of these guys. <laughs> yeah, if they weren't not legendary. as good because it's legendary. Um. Cast Nissa minus. Cast Nissa minus. Um. <laughs> what? You uh, could. Yeah, when the other creature I put a counter on was the black green snake guy, you're gonna be. Feeling oh the man, pain. It, that's like. Honestly, this card just seems so good to me. Like, I don't. I'm not. I like. I obviously don't have like gather in. Front, I mean, I do have gather in front of me, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna search six drops in the middle of the show. But uh, the more I like think about this card and read it, um, uh, the more I think I'm underrating it. I think oh, you know what? Of... The green expertise is six Oh, yeah, mana. that would be sweet. He's kind of. I think I... this card is a four. I think this is a build your deck around me card. I want to try this guy with Cryptolith, right? Of course you do. Of, it's yeah, not surprising. I, I, I love that card in general. <laughs> um, but this How many guy... Ornithopters are going to be in this deck? Zero. Uh, but this card feels just like low key good. Like, I don't know that it's like. Its upside is maybe not insane. But this is the kind of guy where I don't think you're ever, like, super upset that you drew him. I, you're like, oh, man, a three mana, three, three. I that think this card creature. is going to be about as good as Nissa Vastwitzir was, and that card was great. And I'm going I'm to give this card a four. I'm going to give it a four. I, I don't know. I I got to play against the card yesterday, like I said, and it was it was really good. It mostly plays how it reads. It doesn't, like, doesn't have any weird, you know, hidden drawbacks or anything. I no, it, I don't know that it's quite, at least in the deck that I was playing against, it didn't feel quite on the power level of a four, but it was it was very good. I don't know, probably maybe a high three, maybe a three point five. 
so what I like about this guy though is that like I I actually kind of it, it doesn't I don't think it actually plays likeness of Astwood Seer, but in the same kind of like pretty decent upside, basically always solid. Like it's just like a fine magic card. You're never like gonna be like, oh man, I can't believe I had to play this guy on three. Yeah. Right. Like he's he's <laughs> just he he's like a pretty good magic card, and when he's great, he's gonna be better than that. Yeah, he does does a, a fairly powerful thing, and I, I certainly expect it will it will be around. It just depends on how good, but like, like green lot. cheap creature well, decks are. And he's legendary, so you probably like maybe don't actually want four of him, just like you wouldn't want four Nissa Vastwood Seer in most decks. But like, I I sort of feel the four rating on him in some sense. In just like, I think he's really safe. Like yeah. if there was a card, I was like, this card will is see just play. going, and it's going to like see play throughout its lifetime. That's why I kind of compared it to Nissa Vastwood's here. Yeah, it was like, oh, it this is just good enough. Goes, that's gonna yeah. like, it's gonna do its thing. It's going to be a format staple, which is kind of what we've decided a four is. And for that reason, that's what that's I, what I'll like. Give it. It'll fluctuate. It'll go up and down. It'll be better in some decks than others, and whatever. But like. There's no way that card just isn't fairly good. Yeah. It's just good on rate. But I can see where Casey's coming from because, like, one of the things that we talked about really early is, like, when we talk about fours, it's, like, Elspeth's Sun's champion, right? Where it's, like... Right, like, it actually, like, standard so, warped around it. Yeah, I, I don't know that, like, you could possibly warp standard around this card just because I, it's almost impossible to play as a four of, I think. Yeah. But... It feels like the kind of guy where if you can put him in a deck where he where you're really getting something out of both parts of his ability, like there's no way that card just isn't good. Next up we have Sram's expertise. This card is two white white for a sorcery. Create three one one servo artifact creature tokens. You may cast a uh, card with a converted mana cost three or less from your hand without paying its mana cost. I hate this card. I've played with this card a lot. I, I I think this card is act, actively not good. I think it's just a trap. Yeah, I, I also don't know about this. Just because, I, like, what are you putting into play off you, of it? Is the my only concern. good thing that I put into play off it so far is Nissa. I got to put Servo Exhibition into play off it, which was kind of cute. And then untap and cast the blue draw three. I don't know. This card is, is weird to me. I, I have a hard time evaluating it because I think that this card is probably the reason that always watching says non-token. Oh, obviously. Uh, like, no, like... The combo. I, yeah. No, like, I... Like, I, like straight up, though, right? Yeah. Like, legitimately, yes. Yeah, because, like, it always was... That was always kind of a weird... Because, like, who cares about that? Um, I just don't know that you're put, ever going to put in anything to play that, like... The deck that wants three one ones Wants, like... Is, like, this is probably going to be the last card in your hand. That's, that's my yes. point is, like... It costs four mana. Well, like, so are you holding your Nissa? Like, are you? What are you casting instead? There's a chance that like this is your after the wrath spell, like out of your sideboard, like your rebuilding spell. But like the it's problem that I have with good. that is like you can just play Gideon in that slot. Well, my problem with it is it just isn't good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, That's right? my like, point. Like four mana for three one ones just isn't a good rate. Like I, the other ones feel a lot of the other ones feel like threaten for three competitive rate. So right? Casey, I believe that this card is a zero. So how upset will you be with me when I give it a point five? You call me a coward. <laughs> yeah. Uh, All right, I mean, I'm going to give it a zero. I think this card is actually bad. Yeah. I, I also I think this card is. I just I don't I don't see the deck that it goes. You know in. what the thing is is I tried it in a lot of decks like. I just, it just doesn't, it doesn't do what I want it to do. It's always like this, it's like the worst card in my deck every time I have it. I think if it made four one ones, it might be good enough. If it was a four mana four four split among four bodies? Well, I mean, how often has Servo Exhibition felt like you're getting an above rate spell? Because this is worse than that on rate. And getting a free spell in the kind of decks that want that effect just isn't yeah. really very good. So what, what would you rate it? I don't know. I also tried this a bunch in a couple of decks for the last few days and it's just not I'm with you guys they're, they're like the decks that want this style of card don't have things hanging around in their hand to cast did either of you guys have this on your list mm, well Michael you no. didn't submit a list so no by definition <laughs> boom okay so neither this all came from the listeners which is good I mean they, they got to hear our opinion on it right that's like why we invite because if it had just been our list we wouldn't have even gotten to talk about the card 
Yeah, I, it's factual. I think this one is kind of a trap. I see why it like looks interesting, and it feels like, oh, like green-white token Z, oh, this should be good. But I don't think there's, like... The problem is the decks that want this kind of card are curve decks, and you can't, like... There's... The top of your curve is oh, right. four. Exactly. There, there's no threes to play once you've... Once you've played your four drop, yeah. All right, let's. So you're gonna give it a zero, also. I mean, that being said, it, I'll probably get ranch. By so the to be fair, when we all give it a zero, that. Kyle Fubo is going to buy like five million of them. <laughs> yeah, and well, I'm sure that and probably gonna, be right. This this card is gonna like win a bunch of SCGs or something, and I'm gonna sign a bunch of them. I'm gonna and... say I'm gonna directly lose <laughs> to this card at the Pro Tour like 85 times now that I've said I don't think it's playable. But, you know. Next up, we have Green Belt Rampage. This card is one green for a three four elephant. Man, what a card! Yeah, uh, yeah just really stop good. reading there. This is just, a, just the this, broken this version is, of Wild McCall. Yeah, it's a five. Uh, it also has when it enters the battlefield, pay two energy. If you can't return it to your to its owner's hand and you get an energy, um, so I think this card is, uh, this card is a definition two point five in my opinion. This card is exactly what it looks like. <laughs> it is like a role player in your deck that you'll play some number of, and it's going to be good in the decks that it's good in, and it'll be a role player in standard, and that's it. Like that's this card is the perfect example of a two point five in my opinion. Um, interesting. I think this card is great. Um, I think that if you are in a deck that can produce a lot of green mana, like, if you play this on one, get an energy, again, play it, play it on two, and then play it again on two, it's basically, like, it's like a you... Two mana, three, four. Right, which is better than you're getting a rate on the rate of, like, most of the cards you're playing. Sure. Um, in that slot. And then it's a one mana trigger revolt if you aren't producing a lot of energy. Yep. I found this card to be pretty good in basically every deck I played it in. I think it's it's a card that will probably be a four of in a lot of creature decks. All right, I it will be tried like this one with uh, with Pummeler. I'm sure you guys have played against you know Pummeler playing this card, and I kind of like it in that deck. Like the three four for one sort of gives you a little bit of a different element because one of the things that a lot of the decks that make a lot of energy lack, like they're is high toughness. Uh, just high toughness, like things that survive wrath effects. Yeah, and just um, guys kind that of are good at rumbling diversity. in the aggro matchups. And if if you can sort of use either half of him, like if you can sometimes use him as an energy generator and sometimes as an energy user, like if you can use him both ways, I think he's really good. And I haven't been able to try him in a deck that's like super interested in just getting revolt with him yet. But I'd be curious to try that as well. What would you rate it? This card is kind of hard to say for me. It it so much depends on like what ends up being good deck wise, because I think if there's like if there's a green based revolt shell that's good, this card is clearly great in that deck. Like great, great. Yeah. If there's an energy shell, I don't know that he's he's not like exciting in that deck, but I think he's solid. So somewhere between like a two point five and a three, depending on. Yeah, what's interesting is I actually think that this card is not that good in like decks that actually produce a lot of energy. Like you should not be playing this alongside a tune with the Aether basically ever, which is, is kind of interesting because it reads like something that wants energy. But I think that it's it's better as a small time energy enabler and occasionally like a 3-4 that you play on 2 to block their an advocate So where, where I liked it in the energy decks is that it gave me a really good creature in the aggro mirror. Because just like a 3-4 for 1... When you, if you're already casting other spells that make it, so like in different matchups, it kind of worked differently. Yeah, it's right. That like sometimes it was more of an enabler, but in some matchups, it was very much just like, why do I get to play a three four for one? This seems you know really good when you're attacking me with veteran motorist. Yeah, exactly. It's it's an interesting card. I think it's probably a three because I like at the end of the day, it's still a three four. It doesn't do anything. Yeah, um, and it's but, also interesting to note uh, here that like, you know, we we have vastly different wording on how like we feel about the card and yet our grades are pretty close together. Like that's kind of why the conversation is more important than the grades at the end of the day. Well, it sort of depends yeah. on like, th this just feels like the kind of card that isn't ever going to be like format defining. Yeah. You're not going to be playing like the green belt rampage or format, right? That, that just like, isn't a thing that's going to happen, but shows what we know. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah. 
You can quote me on that. <laughs> Famous when this last blows words. up in my face. But we're going to be the Rams expertise green now. Rampage format. <laughs> yeah, it's a combo deck. You can play it for free, and then it bounces back to your hand. It's so good. Yeah, it's like nothing even happened. <laughs> but I, I mean, I do think the card is powerful. Just like a, a lot of the energy creatures are kind of weak on rate, and this guy is great on rate. So I think that he gives you a little bit of a different yep. dimension. That's how I feel about the card also. Uh, next up we have Heroic Intervention. This card is one and a green for permanent. An instance says permanent control gain hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. Uh, this card got 23 points. Uh, and yeah, this is a classic sideboard card. Like, it's a card you'll put in your sideboard. Uh, we have grades that we give... Uh, called sideboard and combo where they just kind of don't fit in like anywhere else um we did that a few sets ago and uh, a while ago now but yeah sideboard and, and combo and this is definitely just a sideboard card yeah i could see maybe like weird decks playing it in its in its main deck but it's it's pretty good right like as far as They've printed a lot of instants that counter wraths, basically. And this is certainly the best version of that card ever printed. Eh, I think the best version of that card ever printed was Boros Charm. Nobody's ever used that mode of Boros Charm. <laughs> um, Have you played the burn deck that beat a set GP Albuquerque? Yeah, they, it was two mana deal four damage. <laughs> against <laughs> us. Against everyone. Uh, I mean, other than like in the Boros Reckoner, Azorius Charm, Boros Charm. Oh, combo Lucky deck. Charms. Oh, man. It was just that was just good clean fun. Oh man, Lucky Charms! You know what Lucky Charms is? A uh, mediocre breakfast cereal and a sweet, sweet Jeskai combo deck. Yeah, I played that deck a lot. It was good times. Um, but yeah, this card is is perfectly fine though. It's yeah. it is it it does exactly what it says it does. It do and it does it There's, every time. But it does it yeah. really well, right? Yeah, like, exactly. It's really flexible. I think the fact that it counters a wrath, and it can counter a burn spell, and it can save your creatures from combat, like, oh man, you know what's really powerful? We have Barrel's expertise on this list twice. Yeah, good old apostrophe. Um, <laughs> yeah, the first time, the first <laughs> time, you know, I don't know what that card is. Exactly. Um, so that's on me. Um, but yeah, I, I think that this card will will be the thorn in the side of every control player on Earth for the next two years. Well, it's going to make you lean towards playing minus X, minus X effects instead of Fumigate, right? It's all right. I'm going to throw in a surprise card um, for this list since we have two... Uh, oh, no, that's already on the list. I'm going to throw in my surprise card. We're going to talk about Glint Sleeve Siphoner. Is that not on this list? Because it's not, and it should be. And what? it should be, like, number two. What this is, card is ridiculous. happening? What is happening? Yeah, that card is, is really good. So let's, uh, let's talk about that. Just... You know, sure. sometimes things change. Yeah. Sometimes I don't read my pivot tables that closely. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that I have so. single handedly harassed everyone we know into thinking this card is good. I don't know that you harassed me at all. Yeah. I required no harassment. I, think, I, I feel like I, I was, I would not shut up about this card no, from I, the first time I saw it. Or maybe I, that was Matt and Alex. I don't yeah. Know. I played a bunch of terrible decks just trying to make this card happen for myself. So have I. And it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. all of those yeah, decks are better yeah. because of it. Yeah, the draws when you when you have this card, it is it feels like Dark Confidant basically. It feels way better than that. So what are you fact, talking about? The fact that it has menace like is surprisingly powerful. Yeah, so this card is black and one for a two one menace human rogue. When it enters the battlefield or attacks, you get one energy. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may pay two energy to draw a card, and you lose one life. I'm just gonna say this. I have no idea what these are selling for right now, like pre-ordering online. But if there was one card I was gonna like go hard on, yeah. it would be this one. You gonna go hard in the paint on this one? I mean, I'm not because I'll be able to borrow them. But maybe if unless I you to. unless you just convince the world to buy them all up like an idiot. You know. So um. Yeah. So leave leave four in stock. But you know. All right. The rest so you're high on this card. What makes it great? That it's good when you try hard, like. So sometimes you're like a tune with Aetheron 1 or Aether Hub into Black Source and it gets to draw a card immediately. But a 2 1 Menace in a deck that's like trying I to. I mean, attack, not immediately. It's still on your upkeep. Sure, right. But like you get it the first turn and then basically every turn thereafter. Yeah. So sometimes you get to like. 
I don't know. I was playing some games with a with an energy deck where between this and tireless tracker, I was like out drawing decks playing Glimmer of Genius. Like nice Glimmer of Genius. I'm drawing two cards a turn for free. I've also played this in tireless tracker decks. That's where I found the most success with it. Also, I I just I mean, what are you, what are they gonna do? Right. Are they gonna block this and not my tireless tracker? Like good luck. Well, and the fact that it has to be double blocked is like in a deck that's like going wide and attacking, which is most of the decks that I played it in. It's like such a like. I can't keep getting attacked by this, but I can't double block it because then I'm going to like take seven damage this turn and I can't do that either. I, I think Tom Ross had posted a human shell with it, which was similar to what you had tried it in, right? Yeah. Where like, you know, if I have like an expedition envoy and Athalia's lieutenant and this guy in play, it's like, yeah, I mean, I can double block and take like six. What would you rate this card, Casey? I don't know. I'm it's community really... rating is five stars with five for five rating with zero votes. Yeah, I... Maybe that's we how, should edit this out. Is. Does no one realize this is a card in this set? <laughs> what is um, happening? That's know. how good it is. They Wizards rated it five stars. They know already. Yeah, exactly. No, I don't know. This, like, this is the kind of card that I get hyperbolic about, but I think that this card is, like, actually great. Like, we might be in the Glint Sleeve Siphoner format. Right. This card is... So you're, like, 4.5 in this thing. I think it's probably a 4. Maybe, maybe higher. Like, this is a card that could be like the scourge of standard this has consistently felt like the most powerful card i've played with out of this set and it's not really that close okay so you're going 4.5 here i mean I, yeah i don't i don't know what you'd compare it to but like if i look at what's high up on this list i'd take it over i mean i guess i mean 4.5 means that it's a standard all-star that will likely not see like ex like tons of Multi-format play. I, I don't think this card works in multi-format play because, because like, there's energy just, is there's a... such a high marginal cost to playing a bunch of energy yeah. producers as you go back in time. But, like, this feels like playing Dark Confront if they were just, like, yeah, it has Menace for some reason. And there's, like, a deck-building cost to playing it, which is that you have to play some other energy cards. But there are a lot of really good energy cards. Like, it's, it's really... It's just not that parasitic. Like... You, yeah. You'd think that it would feel like a higher cost than it is. Well, yeah, this card, I think, could play just a lot of different roles. Like, even out of the sideboard of, like, like maybe, like, a... Yeah, like, I, uh, I'd been... Aetherworks Marvel type of deck, where you're, like, you're like similar to the Tireless Tracker, where it's just like, oh, God, like... Yeah, I'd been trying a Dynavolt Tower control deck with these in the board. I'm sorry to hear that, but side out all your removal and I'll side in my, you know, dark Phyrexian arena on yeah. a stick. Yeah, it's powerful. Yeah, overall, I, I think this card is great. I I would give it a three point five. I think that it's going to be a real staple in the format. I I don't know that like it'll be format. Maybe maybe it's a four. I don't know. It's good. I I mean, all, all I will say is like if you have not played with this card yet, you were doing yourself. I mean, a I gave I gave the green guy a four. Maybe this is a four too. I mean, they're like. Yeah, I, this he's just this, good. The card's just good. It's just, yeah, I'm gonna yeah, give you it a four. You will be surprised. I'll join you at a four, Casey. Yeah, if you Sweet. play this, you will be surprised. Um, next up, we have Felidar Guardian. This card uh, got 24 points. It is a creature cat. For uh, unlike what Matt Kling thought, it costs a white and three for a one four. When it enters the battlefield, exile target permanent you control. Return that card to the battlefield under your control. Under its oh, oh, another permanent you control. Yeah, under its owner's control. Sorry. Yeah, so, it, so don't flicker something you stole with confiscation coup. Flicker yes. literally anything else, but don't flicker that. Yep. Um. So this card gets the combo grade. Um. So uh, one of the things that I like to remind people is that just because the card's in a combo doesn't mean it's only good in the combo so uh for example uh this card could easily if the combo didn't exist this card could have ended up in like a panharmonicon deck like yeah i mean it plus a pa two of it plus panharmonicon are just infinite mana yeah or just infinite whatever right ETB whatever your heart desires anything infinite everything played. infinite all of yeah. it um you know when deceiver excerpt was a card uh it saw play in non-splinter twin decks it's a play in um, in uh, Bant Pod, which was a just to like get you from two to four in your pod chain, and like this card can have similar roles, kind of like that, where it's just like, oh yeah, I, I actually do want this effect in my deck. 
Yeah, it's, it's like, just a really synergistic card. Right. It. Yeah. Exactly. You're not likely ever going to play it out of a deck that's not playing any combos. Um, but it, you are trying like, but, but it's it doesn't, okay, right? It's like, it's not a guy where you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I drew this card. It's not altar of the brood where you're playing it in your Jeskai ascendancy combo and hate your life. If you don't have the Jeskai ascendancy, right? It's a card that has text. It blocks a lot of creatures that people are playing right now. It kind of, it gets you either a mana back or an ETB back when you play yeah, it. And like a lot of the, a lot of the stuff you'd get with it is like, it's not like super busted, but if you get to... I don't know, flicker a Thought Knots here or flicker a Drowner of Hope or, I mean, if, if we're playing in, like, a Panharmonicon style deck, flickering on any of those ETBs is, like, pretty good. Right? Yeah. It's, I am. it's a fine magic card that has the upside of sometimes reading, oh, also you win the game. Yeah, exactly. It Yeah, it triggers Revolt, which is, like, a little bit more marginal, but not so well, marginal. But it triggers Revolt on a creature that's already in play. Right. right? You can flicker a creature with Revolt to... Yeah, to really so, get him. I think, you know, it It sounds a little worse than it probably will end up playing. All right, next up we have Metallic Mimic. This is an artifact creature for two mana, uh, those being two generic mana. The card is a 2-1 artifact creature shapeshifter. As it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. The Mimic is the ch chosen creature type. Uh, each creature you control the uh, of the chosen type that enters the battlefield with a 1-1 one -one counter on it. Um... So I want to just make it very clear to people. I don't know why I've seen this on Reddit, on Facebook posts. This card does not ETB and Thalia's Lieutenant. Because if it did, and also did the other thing it does, uh, this card would be a 5. It would actually just be... It would be like the, the way... The, the way better, better version, version of every lord ever printed. Yeah. <laughs> it's... It's fine. Um... I actually played it for, like, a couple of matches before I remember that Thought Use Lieutenant is a card. And it was fine. I've played it in Thought Use Lieutenant's decks and been perfectly happy with it. Yeah, if you're, if you're in a really wide deck that wants eight of that effect, like, yeah, it's totally... Or, yeah. like, eight similar types of effect. It's a totally reasonable card. I... I don't know. It's going the, to be at its the, best in... The play, like, the, the... Like, the... Like, a turn one... Like, a Savannah Lion Human. Turn two, this... Turn three, like, two guys. Turn four, lieutenant is like, oh my gosh, his board is so huge. Yeah, so yeah. I, I'm a, I think that part of the card is, like, really good, obviously. I'm a little bit nervous about playing something else that's terrible against Liliano. So, that's actually what I was going to say. Uh, yeah, I, I think that the fact that your deck is already... Most of the decks that would want this card are usually going to be inherently weak to Liliana. Just having another card that's weak to Liliana can can certainly be a problem. Well, it's kind of both ways, though, right? Like, if you're on the play... Then your this... other cards become better against Liliana? Right. I mean, unless they have some sort... Or they could just play I'm, Liliana and kill this, I, and I'm that's I'm curious to see how, like... This card does not line up well against Fatal Push or Liliana, because you're not getting anything when you cast this. And it's pretty bad on Raid itself. So I'm curious to see how this guy ends up turning out, because I pretty much think if this guy is good, it's just going to be sort of the mono white or light splash human shells that are playing it right like That's where I you, you don't really see this popping up all over the place yeah I, yeah, I just don't know yeah if it was a 1.5 is like a role player in one deck yeah I think that any tribal deck in center, like that's a heavy tribal focus will probably play it you can play this and the ether born one and then you have two lords yeah two suspect lords no um, this card is so the lord is great yeah, but it's like five mana. It's not five, it's four. It's, it's whatever. You can cast it off Barrel's expertise. Boom! Boom. <laughs> um, you can cast this one off the white expertise and do nothing. You can cast this one. Yeah, it happens in the wrong order. <laughs> you can cast this one off the red expertise. And, I mean. And also just have a guy and steal their guy. I think the red expertise Boom. might be surprisingly reasonable. That's I, I think that was like, oh, is it on here? Is that what this is? No. no, that's the green oh, one. I think it was like really high on my list. The red one. Anyway, um, yeah. So what do you guys give this? I, I'm giving it a one point five. I think it's like a role player in one deck. Yeah, probably pretty close to that same thing. It's it's fine. It's like it. I don't expect it to ever be broken, and well, I don't expect is, it to be unplayable. This like, is like the crappy version of Thalia's Lieutenant, which it's kind of like the crappy version of Adaptive Automaton. 
I don't even know what that is. It's a three mana two two that just is a lord for a chosen type. Okay, so the crappy version. This still is like the crappy version of Thalia's Lieutenant. Whatever, it's fine. This card is okay. Next it's, up, it's playable, right? Like, yeah. I don't know, I'm gonna at least try it, but I don't expect it to be great. Next up, we have Oath of a Johnny. This card is a legendary enchantment. It comes in with twenty nine points, and a Johnny finally took the oath, folks. Uh, many of you have already seen this card. It was like a huge deal when it was spoiled. People were just talking about it forever, um, which means I'm probably going to give it a lower rate than it probably deserves because I hate overrated things. You had a lot of time to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this card is a green and a white, uh, and when it enters the battlefield, put a 1-1 one, one counter on each creature you control. Planeswalker spells you cast. Get your Twitter away from here. Planeswalker spells cast. Oh, I thought you were looking up that tweet. Planeswalker no. spells you cast. Cast one less cast i i just can't even planeswalker talk. spells you cost cast one less to cost cost, cast, <laughs> cost. cost. planeswalker spells you <laughs> cast, cast cost one less to cast okay so this card is bad it's fine it's bad i don't i wouldn't pay two it's, mana no, for either i want to be this. very clear about something okay spencer how could you not like this it ramps you into your planeswalkers you're right i would love to go two drop into Gideon. That sounds great. You know what doesn't sound great about that two drop? It doing absolutely nothing other than that. It puts a counter on your Thraben Inspector. Like, so holy crap. This card is like actually terrible. The, the problem, because right? the thing is, is that when it is at its best, it's putting like five counters on guys. And then you could have just cast any card that does that, and it didn't have to be this one. Like, I. Okay, go ahead, Michael. So. I don't think either half of this card is worth two mana. Right? And when you put them together, it's still not worth two well, different colors of mana. The thing is that you're never, like, there's never going to be a game where you get both halves of this effect in the same game. Right, and where it's meaningful, right? Well, right, but you're either getting counters or you're using it as a ramp spell. And I don't know why that's better than, like, playing Servant of the Conduit. But that's my exact, like, literally when I see this card, I'm like, this could just be a Servant of the Conduit. And that card could attack for two. Yeah. And that also puts two power into play and ramps me. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't really see what everybody's so excited about this card. I'm sure that I'm going to lose to some amount of, like, Oath, Gideon, Nissa, Ajani. So and if there was, like, if, here's uh, the thing. Whatever. If there was, like, a, like, you, like, really, really cared specifically that they were counters... That, that that were that were like being put on the creatures, right? Like rather than it just putting power on the board, it specifically put counters on the board. And you like, like for example, the new Gideon, uh, the new Ajani, right? What does he do? Or like with the snake guy, right? With Winding well, that's what I'm saying. Is like yeah. so, like uh, Johnny. Uh, I, it just seems kind of underwhelming. So. Oh, there's two of them. I want this one though, right? So the new yeah. Johnny. It. Why? Why are you so small, MTG Goldfish? Um, it costs six mana, four and green white. It comes in with four loyalty. It's minus two is exile target creature. They gain life. They gain life their plus is draw cards, and then their their minus nine is like put a bunch of one one counters on stuff, right? Is that really what its ultimate is? Um, it's it's minus or its plus is like look at your top three, and you get all the permanents, non land, non -land permanents. permanents. So, like, so maybe if there's a deck that's, like, this is Johnny, and then, like, I don't even know. What could possibly want... I just actually... I can't actually figure it out. Why would I want all of the Johnny in my deck? No, I, I think you're right. It's just... This is, But like, people really like it. Like, they really, really, really like it. So, I get, like, the problem is that every scenario I imagine it in, when I'm imagining, like, it's good cases, it's, like, a passable card, but hardly good yeah exactly. and i can imagine a lot of situations where you just end up like holding this for a bunch of turns because you're always like well i'm only gonna get like one counter out of it and i already have four lands in play so i don't really need to make my gideon cost less i'm willing to be wrong but i actually think this card is a zero i actually can't figure out like maybe it's like a one where it's like it's gonna be like really good in some deck like just busted and it's gonna be like oh all i need for this deck is oath of a johnny but like it just you have to already be committed to the board and then when you're not, like, 
it's doing something that you I uh, I think the problem with this card is it's way more like a charm than people think it is. Think where like that's you, how I you, feel you about don't it. Get but it's it's a two mode it. charm where neither half is particularly powerful. Yeah, I think that there there will certainly be draws where this card seems great. You're talking about a command, by the way, right? Where you get to pick two. No, because you're only going no, to get one you're of the only modes. Oh, one. oh, I see what you're saying. It's it is a charm. I get what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, it's it's a charm. That's how I feel about it too. It's a charm, but like imagine the bad charms because this is a bad charm. And it's a sorcery. Yeah, I just I'm not I'm not really into this I mean, one. Yeah, it's 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 best case scenario is gonna. The problem is it's not even as good. It, like it's just worse than Servant of the Conduit, which when we're talking about like baselines for cards, I'm excited about. It's pretty low. All right, so what are you guys giving it? Um, probably like a zero. I I just I just don't see it with this card. It's a charm where neither mode is good. So you can give it a zero. Uh, negative three. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Walking Ballista is next. It's XX for a zero zero artifact creature construct. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, put X one one counters on it. You can be four to put a one one counter on Walking Ballista, and you can remove an X one X. Uh, you can remove a one one counter. From it to deal one damage to a creature or player. Um, so, what isn't like isn't Triskelion like a card that like sees legacy play in bad decks? Um, you think more vintage play than legacy oh, play? Sure, sure, sure. Vintage is um, yeah, that's a good deck. Yeah, and this is just better than Triskelion, right? Because if you cast it for six, it's the exact same card. Yeah. Uh, no, Triskelion is a 1-1. One, one. Oh, sure, sure. What? Triskelion is a natural 1-1. One, one. So it's a 4-4 oh. for 6, basically. Um, I didn't know that. So this card is... If we were doing this yesterday, I probably would have given this card pretty close to a 0, because I don't think it reads as that powerful of a card. It's surprisingly reasonable, isn't it? Yeah, but it plays much better than it reads. Um, If just, like... It sort of gums up the works against aggro decks and... If you ever get to like activate its ability, you're it's really flexible. It's more of a symptom of winning than like if you're like paying four mana to put counters on it. It's like more of a symptom of winning than a cause, but like it at least closes it, out the yeah, game. It, it ends the game and it's not like it's like this card is fine on two and like I thought the, about this card a lot today. I, I don't know. I saw it or I've played it a couple times in the last two days where its mode was, you know, uh half of a Chandra's Pyrohelix for a Toolcraft Exemplar, and right, that sounds like kind of medium or whatever, but it feels pretty good when you're doing it. I, I think this card is, I think, like, really... I think this could be a key card in the Tezzeret control deck. It's just, it's just like, really decent. It's... And it kills, what, it, like, busts up the Sahili thing. It yeah. kills 1-1s. One if you ever, you know, have, like, 8 mana or whatever, this guy's actually pretty insane. Like, well, if you top deck him on, like, turn 10, he's great, right? Yeah, he's just finished the game. Casey, what would you give this card in as a grade? Um, probably a two or a two point five. I think it's like pretty close to just an average card, and I think it reads like a bad card. So, Michael? I'm sure it'll just get better. Uh, that's that's about where I'm at too. I would give this card a four. Like a four. I think this is going to be a format staple. Interesting. Um, I didn't think that before playing with the card. I kind of was with Casey, and then I was like, oh, this card is good. And then I thought about it more and more and more, and I was like, this card might be better than Hanger Backwalker. Interesting. I, so I don't think that Hanger Backwalker was as nearly as good as people thought it was, and I think this card's a little bit worse than that, and that's okay. kind of what's f f where like I'm forming the basis of my opinion. Sure. Um, I'm, I mean, I we have a 2.5 and a 2.5 and a 4. I think that like it's a wine. It's, that's totally fine. I just... I think that this card is going to end up being a annoyance it's in my life. Good. It's yeah. it's flexible. I mean, I, I think that's probably its biggest. Yeah, it, its biggest sort of. Yeah, I think I had it number right? two on my list. Yeah, I did. Yeah, um, being able to like the most high impact thing I've been able to do with it is flip an Avison, right? Usually by like killing a creature of my opponent's and then dying. Yeah, but it's sweet. Like if and that's you get, really if you, like, powerful. Cast an, Avacyn on their end step and like untap and walking ballista for three or something and you're able to like you know ping down a planeswalker yeah, exactly. and flip like, your Avacyn and finish so it, it off. It does it's the like, whole ugh. zero mana Avacyn thing but it also does like a pretty good just threaten to flip Avacyn instant speed. They, like it, I don't know. It's it's pretty decent. Where like a hangerback walker that's already in play 
can't flip an Avacyn that you draw, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, this one you can already have in play and flip an Avacyn. I don't know. It, it was surprisingly impressive to me because it looks crummy. It looks like it's just going to be so bad on rate that it's hard to... Yeah, exactly. Work. And it's so much less efficient than Hangerback Walker, right? Because Hangerback Walker like got itself big really quickly and this doesn't really do that. You know, you don't like go from one to two but nearly the ping as easily. Thing is but like really good. Yeah, exactly. And if a, a game drags out, this is like this is the card you want to top deck. I think that I could also see this being like good in and against a deck that I expect to be really good. So. Cryptic. But yeah, I mean, it's no surprise that you like this card a lot because it's pretty close to being a fireball. <laughs> um, uh, I don't see myself playing this card much. Mm. Skeptical. I, I don't see five minutes into the future or more than five minutes into the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, man, I don't think this card's close to like even nearly as good as a fireball. <laughs> what are you talking about? I mean, for Next, two mana, it's literally a fireball. <laughs> Well, I think what's going to happen though, a lot of the time is like, so it's not that efficient on rate until you top deck it in a game where like you have like eight lands. Or oh something. my gosh! And then it's going to feel great. If I cast this with Panharmonicon, do I get double the counters? Um, I don't think so because it's not a trigger. If it were a trigger, it would just die immediately. Oh, that's true. Okay, science. Next up, <laughs> science. Uh. Would it die? I don't know. Next but, we have but do you get double triggers for removing counters from it? Mm. I don't. I don't know what Panharmonicon actually says. <laughs> I think, it's I think that's an something. activated whenever, ability, no, so I it's think not it's a, whenever something comes into play. Yeah. Also, like that's whenever, an activated yeah, ability, okay. not get right, triggered whatever. ability. Uh, next up, we have Dislap. This card comes in with thirty-three points. It's blue, blue one for an instant counter target spell, activated ability, or triggered ability. Uh, and that's it. That's the card. Mana abilities can't be triggered. You can't... Targeted. Yeah. Sorry. Mana abilities can't be targeted. Get that forest out of here, Casey. <laughs> yeah. Tap my forest. Not today. Uh, fun fact. Fetch lands are not mana abilities. Those are activated abilities. It's true. Um, Deathrite Shaman also. It's not a mana of, ability. Okay. If you're playing this in a form where your opponent is playing Deathrite Shaman, you're really struggling. Um, Cube I have, is great, so... I have... Uh, I've been impressed with this. I... Like, weirdly impressed. I was like, oh, this will be like Cancel. It's way, 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 way better than Cancel. Right. It sort of reminds me of Dissolve, right? Which was basically Cancel, but somehow way better than Cancel. Yeah. Where, like, most of the time it was functionally the, an identical card, right? Yeah. Um, so, here's here's the thing about this card. I have countered a Liliana Ultimate. I've countered a Nehirim Ultimate. I've countered an Evolving Wilds Crack. I've, like... Oh my gosh, like, I, this card is just like, you just makes your opponent have to think way, way, way more about the game. And I it's, love that. It's closer to summary dismissal than it reads. That's how I felt. I was like, did I just get three mana summary dismissal in my deck? And I mean, a lot of the time it is just cancel, but like, you know. Right. When a, your a fail slight, case is cancel. better cancel is like a pretty good card. Right? Yeah, exactly. Like cancel is horrible. Right. Yeah. Cancel is just like pretty bad, and we're like constantly in the quest for like a slightly better cancel rate, right? like um, essence sc uh, scatter but, to the wind or but this dissolve, is a tricky dis one. Uh, right? dissipate this or is whatever. way better than scatter it's, to the wind. It's right. a tricky one, right? There's there's like a lot of play to it and how you use it, and yeah, right. Um, obviously, I think that this card actually lost some stock with me with the banning of Emrakul, but not like a ton. Um, it still is good against that type of effect. It also gained some stock over its replacement, which is Void Chatter, too. So, you because you can expect to play against less decks that really care about the graveyard, like, Void Chatter got less necessary. So, because of that, you can say that this got a little bit better again. Sure. I mean, I think that it's probably going to be the cancel that you play most of the time because it's just a little bit better than the other ones, right? So, you're going to give it, like, a 1.5? Uh, no, because I think cancel is probably a two, so it's probably a two point five. So okay. I don't think this card is great, great, but I mean I can't really see building a control deck without starting with four of these. That's how I feel. I, right? I think that it's just a four of. I'm gonna give it a three. Uh, yeah, I mean it's kind of a. It's like it's just better than your other three mana counter spells, and you're probably gonna play four. Better of those than your average cancel. 
right? It's just better than Void Shatter. It's better yeah, than I agree. Scatter the Winds. It's you know. all that being said, it's at the end of the. I mean, but it's still mostly it's a three mana it, cancel, right? But also, it's cancel counters on ultimates, which is like the greatest, right? So every once in a while, you get this really great upside, right? But ninety plus percent, it's right. just counter targets, but which is fine. That's that's sort of what they're trying to do, anyways, right? They're yeah. trying to. I think this is a really. It looks like it did exactly am, what they wanted it to. I'm legitimely surprised at how high the next card got. Not that I don't think it's good. I do think it's good. I'm just like we're like getting close to the top ten, right? We're getting close to the top. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is coming in at number eight. We have Yeheni, Unyielding Partisan. This card is. Two and a black for a 2-2 two, two with haste. Legendary creature, Aetherborn Vampire. How can you be Aetherborn and a vampire? How do you live long and... En- Wait, aren't vampire undying? Um, Don't ask yeah. me flavor questions. That's, uh, Hold that's, on. That's, this card is a strict flavor fail, right? No, it's the story of this set. Um, he's like the leader of the Aetherborn Revolt. And he found a way to like oh they live extend for, their lifespans by by, by stealing energy or life or whatever. This yeah. is a really good reason to not worry about the story. Yeah, it's stupid. But yeah, just this card is sweet. That hard about it. I, I'm interested by this. I find this interesting. He's like, we die really quickly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to live forever. Yeah, and he yeah he's an un, undying partisan, which is just a, a great title. Like, yeah, so what he does is he has haste. <laughs> Whenever a, a creature an opponent controls dies, put a 1-1 counter on him. He's going to eat them because he's a vampire. Flavor win. Sacrifice another creature you control, and he gains indestructible until end of turn. See, I was hoping this was just the busted version of Antuko Husk, and he got a counter when you sacrificed a creature you control. That's actually what I so thought this card did that's what I time. read this card was the first time, and I was like, I don't know what they're doing. Like, man, this card is great. Like, why does it, so, like, first of all, like, let's, let's just talk, let's say that it did that for a second, because I, like, actually need to get this off my chest. When I read this card, I was like, well, I don't play Frontier, but you don't ever need to play Antuko Husk again, because <laughs> this card, or cards that give an Antuko Husk haste, because, yeah. like, yeah, this the, has it. The whole haste thing is, like, some, it's like something else, if it, if it were that, If it right? did that, right? Should, like, like, rally, sack everything, kill you, like, in the right now kind of way. <laughs> Like, yeah. I, you know, right now. This, this guy's kind of weird, though. I have a hard time I, envisioning it has, where I actually want this card. So I had this card on my list, and we are going to do... I think that we'll do a podcast on this in the next like couple weeks on the theory of words, which is a magic theory that Casey and I came up with, where sometimes you have a... It, basically, the theory is you have... You, uh, there, you would have enough words on a magic card to make it playable, now, the caveat to that is they have to be words that have impact on the game, right? That's like the laziest theory I've ever heard, but it's also great. It's also how we knew to spec on Deathrite Shaman. Yeah, so <laughs> that's true. That's how we made money on Deathrite Shaman. It just it was, had too many words it was, to suck. I don't even know that I finished reading the card. I was like, I don't it's know like, what this, this does. This has but three abilities. This card, is, one mana. this card is a one mana, 72 word card in a one two creature. I'm going to buy these. I like legitimately did not finish reading the card until after I think I owned 30 of them. Well, it sounds like it's working out for you. Yeah, I did. It worked I out don't great. know that I would buy 30 of these, though. I don't... I, that's not... What I, I mean, it also doesn't have hybrid mana in the top right corner and, like... Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of reasons this card's worse than Death Rite. If Shaman, this card but cost like, one for a 2-2 two, two haste, I think I'd be into it. Yeah, with, like, <laughs> with all two, great, two like, great abilities. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Um, but anyway, what, what I'm saying is this card falls... This is why I put it on my list. It just falls into the theory of words. It has enough relevant text where, like... I didn't have to finish reading all of the relevant text to go, oh, yeah, this card's playable. Maybe. I'm just not sure it's good enough on rate. Yeah, I was, I've been trying to make like an Aristocrats deck work um, with this card as kind of the backbone, and it reads a lot more like the Abyss in that deck than it does Nantuko Husk, which is interesting. The Abyss um, is a great card. Yeah. It, and like, keep the city, like, just kill them. Obviously, if it did... You know, if you got counters when you when your creatures died, like this card would just be insane. But you know, if your opponents are blocking it, or you're playing, you know, fatal pushes or bone splinters or whatever, you know, gets your jollies, then this card could be pretty powerful. I don't. I, it's hard to evaluate because 
It's not, you're not just like playing it for recreation. This is like the, the backbone of your deck if it's in your deck, right? <laughs> so I like it. I, I do. I hadn't thought about playing it with uh, Fatal Push and uh, Vengeful Rebel. Seem kind of sweet with it. Like the like sacrifice a token, give my guy indestructible. I can see the clipped with right guy. deck now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I sacrificed a blister pod to this guy just float yesterday. A, float a mana with my guy. Did it make you feel well, hold on? Dirty. I actually yeah. can see the sequence right now. Float all my mana. <laughs> sack, 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 kill your guy, kill your other guy. <laughs> Dag with this. Is there a Westvale Abbey somewhere in there? No, you don't need... I was talking about with your crypto. All right. What do you guys give this card of the grave? I don't know. This one is so hard to evaluate that, like... I'm going to give it a, a 2.5. I don't know. I it's think it's probably a combo rating. Yeah, because it's, it's probably like a, a 3, right? Because it's the backbone of your deck. If it's in your deck, it's the backbone of it. So one point five because I think if this is in your deck, it's the backbone of your deck, and I don't think this card is and, good. And your deck is bad. Yeah, <laughs> I think you've signed up for a life of misery, but maybe an undying life of misery. So you know, good news, bad news. Yeah. Um, next up, we have Heart of Kieran. This card is two for a four four. Uh, flying vigilant uh, creature. Uh, Just that's really good. There. Yeah, yeah. It's, great. it's powerful. It's also an artifact uh, vehicle. Legendary artifact vehicle, in fact, as crew three, and you may remove a loyalty counter uh, to uh, rather than pay part of its crew cost. So you can, you know, just start removing counters from your planeswalkers to crew this along with your creatures. And overall, I think this card is a solid three. Yeah, I, I don't actually have a lot to say about this card. I think it does exactly what it looks like it does. A lot of people are like trying to play this in kind of weird decks. I think the place that it just belongs is in actually a Planeswalker creature deck. So, you know, decks with lots of creatures and Planeswalkers, preferably things like Liliana and Nyssa and Gideon, like stuff like that, where like you have a lot of loyalty to play around with. Or if you have a Planeswalker that gets like a lot of loyalty that we could fit into that deck to protect things. Uh, just things like that. That's kind of where I see this. It's really good with cheap planeswalkers. Like, if you curve this into a planeswalker, it becomes really difficult to actually kill your planeswalker, and it's really good at fighting your opponent's planeswalkers. Yeah, so, like, I, one of the things about that is people just, like, if I just attack it with my guy, it's like the same thing. It's like, well, except that you lose your guy, whereas you would have gotten a free attack on the planeswalker had this not been in play. That's like the most common argument I see is like, well, if I attack it with my two, ma two with, with my three power guy, and you have to take three loyalty off your planeswalker. Like, yeah, and then your three p power guy just gets eaten. I don't know. I mean, I don't think this card is, like, insanely oppressive, mainly because it's legendary. Right. So there's, like, an upper limit. You probably can definitely not play more than three, and I think plenty of decks probably can't play more than two. Yeah. It depends on, like, how long you want games to go and how much filtering you have, but it's powerful. I mean, a two-mana 4-4, four, four, like... Yeah. It's, it's played really powerfully for me so far. Um... It yeah, being legendary. I think it's a, a card that is actually legendary for power level reasons, <laughs> more so than flavor reasons. Which uh, yeah. is which is like a good sign. And that they tried this as yeah. a non legendary card, and we're like, no, 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 no. And also, you know, the fact that both Chandra and Pia can crew it is you know a flavor win. So this card's really firing on all cylinders. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, I, I would give this card. I think. I think I'm going to give it a 2.5. I think that it's like a role player in some decks. It's a really good role player, though. Like, this this card is very good. You just, yeah. you're capped on how many you can play. Right. Yeah. It's... Do you yeah, see you right there, too? It's, yeah. The, the only downside is legendary. Otherwise, this card would just be great. So it's probably a, a 2.5 to a I 3, mean, somewhere it, in there. It's great regardless. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. yeah. I mean, it would just be like, it would be borderline oppressive, you right? Just, you just can't play 4. Yeah. Next up, we have Ether Harvester. This card is three for a three-five vehicle. It has flying. When it enters the battlefield, you get two energy. You can pay energy to give it life link, and you can crew it for one. Um, so this card also passed the theory of words, and also passed the theory of playing with it. What in the world? Yep. I think that both of these cards, actually the ones we just read, make the banning of Smuggler's Copter look like really aggressive. This card especially would have this crapped card's all over Smuggler's This card's so good. Yeah, it's really powerful. So it's it's a lot less aggressively slanted than Smuggler's Copter. Like, so I don't think every deck wants it in quite the same way. And like the lifelink is less relevant than the filtering in a lot of decks. But if you're like in the market for extending the game, 
This card is really good at like. How are you ever gonna kill a three five? Like it doesn't really die decks. that much in like, my in like in my experience. I have not had this card die hardly ever. Also, the art on this looks like something coming out of the Power Rangers, which is pretty great. I I, I think this card is really really good. It's. And the I, Power Rangers, man. I don't know if it's like it's just not an oppressive card. It's not. It's just good. Yeah, but I, it's I, like it's like really good. It's like good on rate. It only crews. I f- I feel like this card would be playable even if it crewed for two. That's that's so every time somebody crews this with a smuggler's copter or uh, a uh, a like a servo, a, th- a Thraben inspector. Thank you, Thraben inspector in playtesting. I'm like, why? Uh, why? Why can it do that? Yeah. yeah. Why is this happening to me? So I'm annoying. Flashbacks. Yeah, this card is really good at slowing the game down. Like, you're yeah. just not going to kill an opponent quickly when they have one of these in play. I would give this card a three. I think that it it will be the best card in a lot of decks. Yeah, um, I would probably even say three point five. This card is single handedly made a couple of decks feel playable. Yeah, I want to try it in more styles of decks. I want to try it in some mid rangeier stuff, but like I could see this card working really well with like Glint Sleeve Siphoner, for example. Yeah, exactly. It just does just does a lot. But the thing is, there's nowhere this card is like that bad. Are you playing creatures? Yes. Then this card is probably like a <laughs> Man, fine do I have choice. a deal for you. Right? But doesn't it feel like that? Yeah. Like, how bad? Is this card ever bad? <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically, as long as you're playing, you know, cre- like, in, as long as your creature curve doesn't start at Torrential Gear Hulk, this card is pretty powerful. Yeah. Next up, and the, it came in with 50 points, so, like, people really liked it. Next up, we have Shock coming with 55 points. Uh, the most points a Shock has ever gotten. That just feels so wrong. Um, I feel so like all he, these other cards in this list are so much better so than here's, Shock. So here's the thing about Shock. Is we missed, we missed you. That Welcome back. Um, you're like 1.5. Like... Yeah, I mean, it's like a two. It's like a pretty base level yeah, red it's, card. It's like slightly below what you like want to be doing with your life. So two might be correct. Like, you're going to play it, but you're and not going to be enthusiastic about it. And honestly, like, shock is usually not good enough in, like, most mid-range decks. Typically, you would rather have something that deals more damage to creatures in those decks. So it's usually constricted to the sideboard of those decks. And then the you know, the aggressive decks and then sideboard sometimes of control decks, depending on if they don't have better options. This is kind of a funny one. Like being in the same set as fatal push. I have a hard time seeing this really see that much play. Yeah. Um, the only one real... I, I'm going to give this card to, I think that it's playable and like, yeah, there's it's, not shock. To talk it's, about. A, it's, it's one a... damage deal, two damage, start well, creature player. So, so it's fine. On I think rate. this card could make a uh, thermo alchemist great again. It's fine. Well, on other than the, that. It's I don't just know. Like, oh man, just what like, are we doing with our play testing? It's just like a bad, it's a bad amount to get out of a card, you know. Like I mean, shock has just been forever playable. It's, it's like it's literally forever, seen play in every format it's ever been. Forever in. fringe playable, right? It's, it's like the kind just of card that you end up playing playable. sometimes, <laughs> but you're not like this is not a card I'm ever happy to draw. Yeah, but like you don't like playing decks with shock, so like obviously you wouldn't be happy. That doesn't mean that like the card isn't playable. I'm not saying it's not playable. I'm just saying it's really underwhelming. I mean. Yeah, you like to play specifically decks that are good against aggro and, like, don't want shock. Like, obviously, you wouldn't like this card. I, I mostly just question in, like, in the Fatal Push set what what shock is really going to end up getting to do. It's probably going to see a lot of play in red, non-black decks, right? That's yeah, that's where I would expect it. No. I, I, I don't think... That, I think that it will see most of play in aggressive decks. I think that it could... Yeah, I really think that this card could not target creatures and it would play almost the exact same way in almost every game that it would be cast in this format. I, I like that Well it, one thing it does do though, if if you think about it though, now that Smuggler's Copter is gone, it does kill uh for example, it kills uh Tyler's Tracker before before the, the like when the crew's been crack, cracked, it kills uh stupid Thraven inspectors that are in your way and like your Which Thalia's. is like a, yeah, Thal Thalia was the next one I was gonna say. Like there's just so many things that like just have two toughness right now that having a card that can kill those creatures that are in your way in your aggro deck that in the matchups where you just don't freaking want a fiery impulse can just go to their dome so that it's not wasted. Well, I know. So I guess this also kills Sahili. Um, it does kill the co- is break up the combo. Yeah, kind of nice. Um, I guess what we're, we're playing a 
few of them in the Mardu list we've been trying, and it's like mostly medium in that deck. It's it's, like, it's a card you kind of get roped into playing, and then every time you draw it, you're like, oh man, what's happening to me? Yeah, I feel like mistakes were made most of the time that I have shock in my hand, but it's fine. I don't know. It it it's it does what it says it does. Like, it's depressing to me that this came in at fifth. That's all. That's all I'm really. Saying. I can understand that feeling. I can understand. I, I appreciate that sentiment. Next up, we have Tezzer the Schemer. This card comes in at fourth, and it comes in with fifty-seven points. Only two more than Shock. <laughs> that was comparable. That was for levels. your benefit, Michael. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> I I actually need to say this because I think I'll forget, but. I gave Michael a lot of crap a couple of podcasts ago about his love for Ornithopter purely as a joke. And then the first deck that I played against Michael for Pro Tour testing definitely had four Ornithopters in it. Was it the deck I was playing or the deck you were playing? The deck you were playing. Oh, well, you can blame that on Matt. Okay. That was Matt's deck, not my deck. All right, deal. Thank uh, you. I appreciate that, though. <laughs> it was just funny to me. I thought that in my head. When you, like, cast an Ornithopter, I was like, okay. Just wanted to, you know... <laughs> Live up to the Live up to the hype. loving hype. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Tezra the Schemer is two, a blue, and a black for a creature. Oh, what happened to him? No, I'm just kidding. He's a planeswalker. His name is Tezra. He comes with five loyalty. He has a plus one to create a colorless artifact token named Ethereum Cell that taps to, and you can sacrifice it to add a mana of any color to your mana pool. You can also pay two uh, loyalty from him, so minus two, to uh, target creature gets plus X, minus X, where X is the number of artifacts you control. And minus seven, you get an emblem at the beginning of your combat uh, combat on your turn. Uh, target artifact you control becomes a artifact creature with base power five base power and toughness five five. Um so here's the thing about this card. Um I thought this card cost five for some reason, so I thought that it was like kind of mediocre. And then I was playing against Michael and it cost four, and it like Basically changed my entire opinion of the card because that's what happens when you, you know, reduce a card's cost by, you know. Cards are generally a lot worse when they cost more mana than you thought they did and generally a lot better when the opposite is true. Yeah. Well, this card is, like, great, but it feels close sometimes. So, like, I don't know, some of the games I've played with it. Yeah. I, he does it's, some powerful things. I think this is, a like, a card that you'll build your deck around because, like, how else could you play with this card? And I do think that there will be... Tezzeret decks at SEGs, at FNMs. I think this is like a 3.5, and it will be a role player in the standard format that decks will be built around. Like, it just ticks all the boxes, right? It's a... I mean, <laughs> the <laughs> the games that, like, blew my mind were... The ones where you, like, make an art like, artifact every turn, and then you're tapping them for mana, but you're not sacrificing them for mana, and it was so annoying. I was like, Why? Yeah, it's if if you're using like the improvised cards, yeah. it's pretty sweet. I think this is the kind of card too that like it feels like it has a high ceiling when I play it, but it only has a high ceiling if the deck you build to put it in is good. Right. So it's that's important. It, it's the kind of card that's going to feel really bad mostly because you're going to try to build decks around it, and they're going to be decks that don't get there. And then someone eventually is going to figure out some good deck that happens to play this card. And you're going to be like, oh man, this card is a lot better than I thought because finally some non-idiot, you know built a good version of the crappy deck I was trying to play. Yep. Yeah, I I just don't see it with this card. I want to. I very much want to see it, and I don't. I think this card is really bad. Give it a grade. 1.5? Maybe a 0? It's... I think this card will, like, you'll see a lot of play at the beginning of the format, then people will, will realize that it doesn't do anything, and then it will never see play again. Alright. Michael? It's so hard to say. It's just... I mean, like, you were talking about combo cards, and obviously this isn't, like, a literal combo card, but this is, like, an archetype-type card. If there's yeah. a deck that can use all this stuff really well, I think it's going to be really good. Because if, if you're routinely able to cast it on four and, like, kill a small creature with the minus or plus and, you know, like, open up a lot more mana next turn, that's really good. If you can't do that, then it's unplayable. There's not really any in-between. Yeah. Right, I mean, I assume that's what Casey's saying too, right? You you fall more towards the I think this is unplayable side think, of things, but it's but it's even when you're doing it with this card, I think it's medium. I think if you're like firing on all cylinders, this card's probably a two point five. Sure, I mean, it's mostly just that the the modes are so different, um, for better or worse. Like mana generation and killing things are 
pretty separate, and he does an okay job of closing out the game. All right, next up we have Achilles Expertise. This card is Black Black 2 for Sorcery. It deals, it doesn't deal any damage. All creatures you... Uh, oh my gosh. All creatures get minus 3, minus 3 until end of turn. You can cast a spell from your hand with converted mana cost 3 or less. Um, okay, so... I, I think this card is good. I think that it is the first card that people talked about in the set... And the hype train got a rolling, and nobody really put a stop to the hype train. Um, you know, if you listen to other podcasts with certain Hall of Famers, then they basically told you this card was vintage playable, and that's not true. Uh, what? <laughs> I felt like it came like the hype mostly came back down to earth on this a little bit. I like, hope so, because like all I've heard about this card is it's like it's broken and it will be banned. So. This card is fine. Strong. It's just fine. It's it's going to be... It, I think that it will be a four of to a three of in some deck. The thing is, is like, you have... So, how do I say this? So, like, uh, it's a little bit worse than Languish, right? Because the, for the what you're trying yeah. to get out of it, it like, the the minus is just... Yeah, unless, or like, getting the mana back out of it is just not yeah. as good as getting the extra point one of, of minus one. One minus of the one. things that... Um, was said on another podcast was like you get it's it's they just kept comparing it to blood right elf and that is just so not even close to what's happening here so you don't get card advantage from casting this card or any of the other cards you want to you get a mana advantage and that is a very dangerous and potentially broken thing well it's powerful but this card all comes down to how good the first half of it is right yes if, if the languish half is good Card then the great. card is really good. And so that's what's really going to be really important here is where do X3s lie in the format of a deck where you can play this card um, and then put a Liliana into play or put a or or use a Ruinous Path to kill their other guy. Like It's just going to depend on what that looks like. And for me, this is just always going to be a role player in your deck and I'm going to give it a 2. I think that I think that there's 0% chance the C's play out of standard. I don't know why anyone's talking about this card in modern or Yeah. I this it's fine. So like I think anytime you're putting in specifically Liliana, it's really good. Or or Nissa or like anything on that same power level where it's like, okay, the board is now stabilized and I'm going to play a threat that is going to take right. over the game. That's great. That's good clean fun. Yep. If you're using it to like cast another removal spell that's pretty good but it's not like that that's yeah one, exactly and the thing is is you're not <laughs> you're not drawing a card when you do this yeah. you're casting a card from your hand See, so right. it accelerates you i'd go further and say that like if you're playing a ruinous path off this in addition it's probably like not even that good i mean unless it's like so like if you can kill their two drop their three drop and then cast a ruinous path to kill their gideon like you're really doing it right yeah so like that that's, that's pretty specific, specific. sequence is yeah. really good my issue is more that like you just this one more than literally all of the other ones combined the back half of it just isn't relevant it's nice if it happens but you're playing this for the front half and wraths are already generally so good tempo wise that i don't think like what you you don't what you don't need to staple tempo onto wrath of god like <laughs> they're already that Th it, they're already that part that already part. happened. Right. Yeah. yeah, like you already got to like invalidate two of your opponent's turns for one of yours. Like if you get to put in a planeswalker, cool. But like a lot of the decks that play this kind of card, you like the less than fours in your hand are gonna be like a fatal push and a metallic rebuke. And you're gonna be like, Well, I killed all your creatures, so none of this is stuff that I'm interested in casting for free. Yeah, that's what's weird about this card is I think that it's it's probably not as good in control decks as you would think it would be for it like feels, a wrath yeah, effect. Yeah, it's like better in like a mid range, like a big mid range deck, right? Yeah, like like a, a ex exactly. And I just don't know like kind the, of the weird... old language siege rhino deck, right? Where like exactly you if you could cast you know an Abzan charm to draw cards or something like that you know off this then it would be great. But I just don't know. That sounds like a sideboard card out of like a black based mid range deck, not like a format staple, right? Yeah, I just I don't know. I don't know how to construct construct the best Yehini's expertise deck. This card just feels a lot closer to Radiant Flames than like most other things to me. Then like, Bloodbraid Health. Well. I mean, it's just nothing like Bloodbraid Elf, except that it costs four. Right. 
and it, and you know, hits something that cost it makes something that costs three free. But yeah, but I, like you I, in a control deck, you just don't even really have things you want to cast most of the time. That's my thought. Is it's, like you're just gonna be stuck with like a counter spell in your hand. Um, let, let so let's give it a grade. What do you think? Um, it's probably a two point five. I think it'll be a fine sideboard card and like I, pretty like really good in the matchups that it's good in. I'm I'm gonna give it a two point five. I think that it will be main deckable, but just gonna be an average card. I think it most it's sort it depends so much on like what the power and toughness of creatures getting played in this format is, but like it feels like a, a you know languish minus, so it's like a C plus kind of card. Sure, right? I mean, I guess that puts you at about a two point five or a three. It's All like right. fine, but not. You can't build around this card. Is basically the right? the no, number I, two card. Yeah, which and the most annoying card I've played against so far. Metallic Rebuke. This card is two and a blue for an instant. It's improvised and it's counter target spell and lets them control face three. Yeah, so this card is way more mana leak than you want it to be. And sometimes it's like way better than that, right? Yeah, this card feels like worth figuring out how to best play it because this card is great. This card is like three mana for that effect is fine, it's mostly cancel. Yeah, it's an easier to cast cancel. Right, but right. sometimes it's a lot better than that. Sometimes it is a lot, lot better than that, yeah. if your deck... Sometimes it's like a, the broken version of Force Spike, right? Or like, yeah, I mean, like I... or anywhere you're like... Yeah, so the number of times where I've been like, I can't cast the spell in my hand because they have a mana up is like yeah, highly right, irritating. Right, right. You can't live your life that way. We, we kept playing yesterday, right, where I would have like a tireless tracker and a couple of clues in play. And it's really weird to be like... Well, those are kind of lands. Yeah. Like, it just feels... Yeah. Uh, it's I've, a strange one. I think this card is going to be a format staple. I think that the amount that it's man leak makes just... Is is enough that I, I... And, like, this is all some very good Magic players are talking about. Well, understandably, they love blue decks. I love blue decks. I, I think this card is a four. I think it will define standard for some... At least part of its lifetime. Yeah, I think that this will be a major player, and it could be so good that like it may make other like may make disallow less good because you can only play so many counter spells. Oh, I think this card is much, much, much better than disallow. It's yeah, just I'm that, saying, it's like, just that there's a deck building cost, right? Right, that's what I'm saying. Like you can only play so many counter spells in your deck most of the time in standard, so, and this will probably push a lot of them out because it's right more so powerful. It's kind of like Tezzeret, right? In the sense that like. It's like Tezzeret if Tezzeret was just always good, but eventually you're going to play against it in some shell where it feels, like, borderline broken. Sure. Right? Like, it's like Tezzeret and then we ratcheted it up. Right? Yeah, to exactly. Where, like, it's just always... Three mana for Mana Leak is, like, mostly fine. Yeah. And like, it's frequently two. And sometimes one. And when it's one, it's like, whatever, how could I ever win? Right. Uh, the the tempo that the card can give you occasionally. And the thing is, like, if you play the game in a certain way, I think you can make your opponent... Res it's an easy card to, like, intentionally telegraph when you don't have it or to try to hide a little bit when you do. Right. And I think that, like, that part of it... You're, you're going to get a lot of incidental value out of, like, having played one of these in game one and then it's game three and you have a couple of clues sitting up and your opponent, like, has to respect Metallic Rebuke. Yeah, that's, like, one of the most powerful parts of Mana Leak was, like, I can't just, like, jam, jam, jam. But uh, I also can't not, not cast spells. Yeah, so... so I guess I'm just going to concede. <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be it's gonna be interesting. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to give it a four. Yeah, I, I agree. Maybe even, like... Yeah, it's probably, like, almost the basement for this card, right? Yeah, well, it's, I, yeah, I don't know that this card is, like, multi-format all-star, but this card is, like, really solid. It's it's just good, right? It, it's not that bad if you're paying three for it every time. Yep. Yeah, exactly. It's you just know, fine. It's not every set, though, that we do get a five. And the next card is a five. Uh, yeah, this card is great. This card will... This card was number one on every submitted list. Yeah, I think... Was it so. number one on yours, too? Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's literally the only five in the I mean, set. Yeah. Well... <laughs> this card will be... Will probably like warp the best every format. card in the last, like... A lot of sets. So the card is Fatal Push. It's a black. It's an it's it's an instant, and it's destroy target creature with converted mana cost two or less. Like, 
What more could you want? Oh, wait. No. No, it's not. It also has Revolt. Destroy target creature with that has converted mana cost four or less. Instead, if a permanent you control off the battlefield this turn. So yeah, it went from like mini smother to super smother that cost half the mana. My favorite thing was Apollo tweeting how good this card was. And then he said, he like five minutes later tweets, wait a second. This card triggers off of fetch lands. This card is insane. And I was like, yeah. Uh, yes, there was a really even, good. Even he thought it was bad, it was good. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is like it's it's just better than Disfigure, which already sees modern play and legacy play. Like, yeah, I mean, comparing this to Disfigure is like comparing it, a Porsche to a Fiat. Like, the card is just uh, the card baseline is already good. Like, it already kills Tarmogoyf and every aggro creature you could want. I mean, in like, it would already be a multi-format sideboard card. I think this if card it did is nothing else, substantially better than Path to Exile. Oh. I think this card. I think I, this card is better than Swords to Plowshares. I said that. I said I think this card is better than Swords to Plowshares. And people are like you're crazy. I'm like no. I like I. The, so okay. So you have Taster. You have. That's it. Gr like Grizzlebrand. Uh, okay. Which which if I had Pat like I was never beating once it came into play. Right. It wasn't. It doesn't matter what removal spell it is. It wasn't going to resolve. Right. Well, I I actually don't know what. Gr so Taster was like it. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think Gurmog Angler is a little bit more popular than Tassigur in Legacy right now, but yeah. So in Legacy, that, yeah, that modern effect. modern would be Tassigur. But, but in, in modern, it is literally Tassigur that it doesn't kill. Yeah, and yeah. I think that that are there are there any other creatures cards that this people play? Kill? No, not that I can think of. Not not like no, good I, ones. It's literally no. better than Swords of Plowshares. Yeah, I think that like cards like Delve creatures will get more popular because of this card, right? Because yeah. it's like. Oh, and because this card wants you to play a bunch of, like, fetch lands. I cut and... terminates for my Jund deck so fast when I saw this. Yeah, I, think... I mean, it's almost like, why even bother playing Jund, right? Isn't like it, It's the kind of thing that makes, like... Because Lightning Bolt's bug. really good. Yeah, but it's just, like... But, yeah, it, it, well, yeah, Bug became, like... Became a real option, right? Or just green-black. So that, like, that opens you up to who think, knows what. I think this card is, like, potentially great in Grixis Delver. Um, like could make that yeah, it's a real good deck. in decks that have black mana and fetch lands, right? But when you're especially when you're trying to get away with running like a really low land count, and you're playing Tassigers yourself, yeah. you're sort of double doing it. Yeah, there's there's just right like this I, card. Yeah. This card is like oppressive. I I actually I I mean so we have I mean I, wow I just, I don't have words. Yeah, this... I so. They do a really good job of printing cards that like have modern playability outside of standard. They've gotten a lot better at it, and I really appreciate it when they do it. This card is standard playable, but it isn't. It isn't like Doomblade, right? But in other formats, it's like oh, super like, Doomblade. Yeah, it's like way way better. One than mana that. Doomblade with no restriction. Yeah, it's the card is great. Like. And the funny thing is, is like, well, what do you do when, like, you don't have a fetch on? I'm like, you kill their Tarmogoyf? Like, what are you talking about? Oh, yeah. that, no, that's the thing, right? Like, 95% of the time, non-revolt is good enough. Right, and then, like, if they kill your creature, then you get to kill their bigger creature. Like, oh, this this card is going to, like... Mo Modern will never be the same because of the printing of this card. It's yeah. insane. I just... I think it. I think it's vintage playable. Like I think the cards. Yeah, like if people played creatures, right? No, like you, you'll definitely board this like against mentor decks. Right, in vintage. No, but it, it's that was like one, one of my of, first thoughts. One of the two or three best spot removal spells ever printed. Yeah, yeah. This card is just something There's like else. Basically, no downsides. Yeah, a lot of people are like I. And at the same time, they balanced it for standard. Right, swords to plowshares would be terrible to play with in standard. This card is fine. Yeah. Like, the slower a format is, the less good this card is. And when you don't have fetch lands, like, it's not that easy to just, like, snap trigger revolt yeah, every time. Yeah, it was actually funny. Uh, so, when yeah, they this, when like, they spoiled revolt, I was like, I wonder if we'll get fetch lands. <laughs> just, like, another, just another, like, six months of, or, you know, of, of like, And then the you saw this land. card and you said, oh, no, that's definitely not <laughs> happening. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I was like, oh, like, we're gonna, we, maybe in, like... The last set of the next block will get fetch lands, and we'll get like six fun months of like but, a whole new standard, right? Because like the mana bases would change so much, and this card is be really perfect cool. for a no fetch land standard, right? Well, that's the thing. And then I saw this, and I was like, oh, yeah, probably not. Yeah, we're that, not. That sounds. We impressive. are not getting fetch lands, and if we do, the format's just gonna be so weird. Yeah, yeah. you're gonna be playing a lot of five cost creatures. Yeah, like a lot, a lot. 
All right, that is it for the set review. How, how do you guys feel about the set? Um, I like that most of the really good cards are interactive cards. Like, I think that that's a huge boon uh, because standard has been sort of dripping off, like, tipping off on in interactivity recently. So that's nice to see. And I think that the cards, there's a lot of interesting cards that, like, I felt like I really struggled to evaluate a lot of the cards in this set. That's where, how like, I felt too. Like, Smuggler's Copter is, like, you know, pretty obvious. Heart of Kieran is pretty obvious. But, like, there's a lot of, like, I actually don't know how good Yehenny is. Or it, even, even the cards that you know are good, it's hard to tell how good they are. Stuff like Aether Sphere Harvester, right? You're like, well, yeah, I mean, obviously this card is good, but is it, like, oppressive good? Or is it just like, yeah, this card is good, good? Sorry, my... I'm just... Go ahead. I don't know. I, I think a lot of stuff... There's, I mean, there's cards that aren't even on this list that I'm really interested in, like Renegade Rallier and some other stuff like that that... I mean, and there's a, a creature that makes a monkey token in this set. We didn't even talk a about A legendary that. monkey token. Legendary monkey. I Honorary mean, number one. What more could you want in the world? I think this set is sweet. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, we haven't we haven't done it in a while. Do you guys have any shout-outs this week? No. Michael, you have any shout-outs you want to give? I do. That's why I'm doing this. Okay. Well, you should have let on your own shout-out so Casey and I had some time to come. With the I'll, I'll say my shout-out. So I, uh, I left my job today. It was my last day at a company that many fans know that I'm like pretty passionate about. I left a company called Thumbtack. And uh, I just... I just don't... I don't think that... The, I, the way I put it to my dad is this. It would be like leaving your church in a lot of ways. Um... I am a different person today because of Thumbtack than I was two years ago. And it's all for the better. I have, other than the fact that like Casey has to hear me talk about Thumbtack a lot, like yeah. it's just mono upside. I mean, yeah, I mean like uh, detached retinas do run in my family. And the fact that I have to roll my eyes so much at you raving about Thumbtack is like <laughs> a real problem. Uh, but... So a few things. One, it's, it's literally the, the best thing that's happened to me outside of a, like the podcast, my wife, like my baby, um, like my puppy, like these guys. I, I just, it's just that been that amazing so in my like life. it's like number 34 on your No, list. it's like way better than like ever meeting Michael. And <laughs> if you had to give it a power ranking. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the thing is, is like, it's, it's good for a lot of reasons. I'm taking a new job in a whole near career path, and, like, they're very supportive of that there, which isn't typical of companies. Like, they're usually pretty mean to you when you decide you want to leave. And I just really appreciate them. I want to give Thumbtack a shout-out. You can check them out at thumbtack.com if you ever have anything you need done in the world. Uh, you know, if you need it all the way from a lawyer to a plumber, go to thumbtack.com, put in a request, and we'll send up the five professionals your way. Well, I can't say we anymore, though. Can you, uh, can you get a podcast shout-out from Spencer on Thumbtack? Is that a... Is that a service you offer? Uh, it is now. I can probably. I mean, I I can probably add that to Thumbtack before say, I leave. Uh, I might <laughs> sign up for some of those. <laughs> but no, it's it's just been an amazing ride, and I just want to give Thumbtack a shout out. They've just been amazing, and yeah, I, I love them a lot. And uh, it's super bittersweet to like. I mean, when you like tell the person that's hiring you like listen i won't leave this company for less than this much money and they're like okay we'll give you that much money it's like well okay it's it's just interesting so shout out to them super cool um and then shout out to the fans uh so i keep refreshing my youtube channel uh because like something weird is happening over just today so this morning we had like 200 and like I don't know, 30 something subscribers. Uh, and like, it's, it was pretty hard to get to a hundred and like, we've been getting a lot every, like we got 10 last week and like 10 the week before that. And then, so we got like, so like close to 30 so far today. And then like every about 10 minutes when I refresh the recent videos. So for example, the ether revolt standard testing video started at about 200 views today. And it's currently at 735. And then the deck tech started at like 80 views today. And it's at 315. Um, so very interesting. Uh, and 20 likes also. I didn't notice that. So shout out to... Yeah, but people. two dislikes too. So your ratio is still worse than the sneak and show one. 
<laughs> which is three to zero. Which has ninety one views. Yeah, it but, only had like sixty or whatever two hours ago when you well, were, it yeah, 80, I put it 80, on a loop. On it my had eighty five. Uh, sure, sure. I put it on a loop on my phone, uh, which was not true. It actually had eighty nine at the time, but it looked better when I put it had eighty five. Uh, oh, the old lying trick. Yeah, and its average view time for those wondering for our 45, 47 minute deck tech is eight minutes and fifteen seconds. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I actually really appreciate that. <laughs> and then people were like, oh my god, this is actually going to go on for half an hour more. But to be fair, you guys did, somebody did tell you they listened to it on the way to the GP. <laughs> yeah, the whole way there. Yeah, they probably <laughs> crushed Casey because of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh man. So shout out to everybody who's checking out the YouTube channel. Uh, with my new job, I'm going to try and post like a lot of YouTube content and like just make it a full-fledged YouTube channel. Um, but yeah, shout out to everybody. Did you say you have a shout out? Michael? No. Still don't have a shout out. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. But I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, shout no out problem. to Spencer for giving me the opportunity to give oh, a shout man, out. Oh man, thanks man. I got a shout out on my own podcast. <laughs> I feel so good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you everybody for listening. Don't forget to check out patreon.com slash ccmtg. Oh man, do we have to do hashtag would that be good? I think we still do. Oh man. All right. All right, hashtag would it be good is our Twitter outreach program. You can tweet anything you would like with hashtag would it be good. And if it doesn't, you know, sell me Ray Bans or have uh, things that prob- you know we're not going to talk about on the show, then we'll probably read it. Oh, you know what's great is I typed in hashtag hashtag would that good. <laughs> and it comes up with a picture of you and Danny. That's great. Well, you know, I'm not the smartest person, so sometimes I just forget words in my sentences. Oh, all right. So we have. Uh, there are Ray Bans. <laughs> yeah. The troll. What's the date? It's the 16th? S- yeah. So we start on the 9th. Yeah. Halfing 15. No, no, no. We already read that one. We already read that one. Uh, we already read that one. Uh, this one. We have. Uh, how was it not. Hashtag Michael work Colossus. Hashtag brother Michael. Uh, so first of all, if you play Metalwork Colossus at the Pro Tour and win the Pro Tour, your new nickname will be Michael work Colossus. Can I get an Oracle ruling on the card and change its name too? I see no reason why not. Okay, well, I might <laughs> I, just play Metalwork. To be fair, if you win the Pro Tour and you like say on camera, like this is now Michael work Colossus, I'm sure people will just call it that. I mean, I'd have to or they'll out. just throw things at you for being so conceited. Yeah, and well, you, I'll, I'll actively boo you, but like, <laughs> but you'll still call it what I request you call it. So it's yeah, fine. it's courtesy. You want a pro tour? Uh, we have an AMA Skype call for patrons uh, uh, of CCMTG at ten dollars per month or more before the pro tour. Hashtag would be good. So yeah, so what we're gonna do? Uh, if you are a t- patron of ten dollars or more a month. You will be invited onto a Skype call with Michael and Danny, who are going to the Pro Tour, and myself. Um, we'll set up a day, uh, bef- you know, sometime before the Pro Tour, and we'll record that Skype call, and then we'll post it on the uh, the uh, as, as the patron only podcast for this month, so that everyone who is a patron can listen to it. But yeah, if you want to be a part of that call, you know, ten dollars or more per month. And you can listen to whatever terrible deck Danny yeah, picks. I was going to say, it might be good or it might just be me and Danny both making really bad life choices. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Dodge buying the naming rights to the new Los Angeles football stadium that the Rams and Chargers will be sharing. Hashtag would that be good. Boo. <laughs> Boo. All right, what's next? <laughs> Is that all you're going to say to that? That's at Kiora's follower. Uh, I don't... That seems fine. I mean, I feel like the number of puns, like, that people are, like, given per day, like, without being booed is too many, so that was probably appropriate. Well, my favorite stadium by far... There are two. Actually, there are two. The uh, the New Orleans Pelicans play in Smoothie King Stadium, or Smoothie King Arena. Yeah, I believe Smoothie King Arena. And which that's, is... I mean, great. Just, who doesn't want to play in Smoothie King Arena? Um, but there is also, I, I believe that, uh, the Louisville men's basketball team plays in the, uh, pizza hut 
Yum Arena or something like that. Which is, <laughs> I do know about this one. Yeah, it's like the Yum Foods Pizza Hut Arena. Something great like that. <laughs> yeah, we're like, it sounds like something where like some semi pro like or like JUCO level college. Should, yeah, that's great. Super I'm all in favor rate. of really outrageous stadium names. Smoothie King Arena, though, I think is my favorite. Yeah, because it's just like Smoothie King doesn't sound like it would be a very big company. So the fact that they have the naming rights sounds impressive, right? It's just great. Every time I think of Smoothie King, I think of the literal song by Bowling for Soup, Smoothie King. Uh, I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, well, that's what I think of. All right, next up we have <laughs> at Spencer Thirteen H at The Rock. I, I, you know, there are things that happen in the world that, you know, I'm just glad come back around and me being tweeted out with famous people is like one of the ones that always brings a smile to my face i i it was always t swizzle for a while which was pretty great but you know i enjoy like you know like kc with his cheese on his grilled cheese i appreciate the (laughs) i liked i liked that grilled cheese video the other day by the way that was great (laughs) Uh, so I watched it. I actually just saw it and just tagged him immediately without watching it. <laughs> but it was I, a really bizarre video. There was people just like eating a lot like of so, American cheese. That seemed like so much work for a grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> I, I didn't watch the video. You should have. It was great. It was like an inappropriate amount of work for what is literally a grilled cheese sandwich. Like nothing special about it other than the fact that it's large. Yeah. I, I mean... But it wasn't even like world record large, right? It was just like really big. Yeah. Just uncomfortably large. And, and the worst part about it is at the end of the video, they put the grilled cheese sandwich in the microwave to finish melting the cheese. I was like, what did I just watch? Who found this appealing? I did. <laughs> they know their target audience. It's just not Casey or you. It's me. All right. Uh, but yeah, gotta know hashtag would that be good. I don't know what gotta know hashtag would that be good would mean, Scotty. I'm really so, sorry. He's gotta know. Would that be good? This Ray Bans deal? That would be a good deal. That is a really good deal on Ray Bans, Scotty. I just click it. So how can like something that I love so much that happens in my life and something that I hate so much in my life come together? I'm gonna and... buy you knockoff Ray Bans for your birthday, <laughs> <laughs> and then tweet at you about your gift. <laughs> <laughs> all right everybody that will do it for this week's episode of constructive criticism don't forget to check out the patreon panel at uh, patreon channel the patreon at patreon.com slash ccmtg check out our sponsor at oasis games and go to the youtube channel at youtube.com search constructive criticism and you'll find us thank you everybody and we'll see you guys all next week